بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على عبد الله ورسوله نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد All praises for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone and salutations, peace and blessings upon his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam upon his family and his companions before we begin the lecture, we would like to begin with a small announcement or a small request from the brothers and from the sisters. And this request relates to this lesson and it also relates to the Jumu'ah Khutbah here in this masjid as well. So I believe this announcement either has been made or will be made in Arabic inshallah, uh, but we're making this announcement in English. And this is a request for those of you who bring young children to the lecture or those of you who bring young children to the Jumu'ah Khutbah. We, or me personally, I always love to see young children in the masjid. And I think that one of the etiquettes of the Prophet Wasallam is to bring or to allow for young children to come to the masjid. And we don't know of any hadith in which the Prophet ﷺ prohibited young children from the masjid and any hadith narrated in this regard, as far as I am aware, all of them are weak. There is no authentic hadith banning young children from the masjid. At the same time, we also have to be balanced and understand the needs of the other people in the masjid as well. So what we would like to request from you is that if you have young children who like to run around like to make a lot of noise that you just keep an eye on them and what they are doing during this lecture and also during the Jumu'ah khutbah and in this you have to have a little bit of a little bit of hikmah and a little bit of wisdom in this lesson if you have a young child with you and you see that the young child is disrupting everyone else in this lesson perhaps the best thing you can do is just to take your child outside give them a five minute break let them run around and bring them back in in a way that doesn't disrupt things for other people, inshallah. With regard to the Jumu'ah khutbah, you can't obviously leave unless it's from the sister's side when one of the sisters can probably leave with the child. It's a little bit difficult for you to leave. So what you have to do is you have to kind of observe your children and be aware of where they are in terms of what their level is. If they are likely to disrupt other people, then I don't think that it's permissible for you to bring them. Because if they are disrupting other people in the Jumu'ah Khutbah, then this is taking people away from a fault that Allah Azza wa Jal has made obligatory upon them. In which the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, مَن مَسَّ الْحَصَى فَقَدْ لَغَى وَمَن لَغَى فَلَا جُمْعَةَ لَهُ أَوْ كَمَا قَالَ Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Whoever plays with the sand has done something, some sort of action which is an inappropriate action. And whoever does this kind of distracted action has no Jumu'ah prayer. If this is the one who plays with the carpet has no Jumu'ah prayer, then how about the one who brings a small child that disrupts the Jumu'ah for 5 or 6 or 10 or 20 or 30 people? They are more deserving of having no Jumu'ah prayer. So we don't say ban your children, we don't say don't bring your children, bring your children ahlan wa sahlan bikum jami'an. All of you should come and we love to see small children in the masjid. But just have a little bit of wisdom Take responsibility for them. Don't use your, the masjid as a hadana where you just drop your kids and let them go. Keep an eye on them. If you find they're getting distracted, take them away from where they can distract other people. And if you find in the Jumu'ah khutbah it's a problem, then just let them, you know, leave them a couple of weeks, let them get a little bit older or a couple of months until they can sit a little bit more calmly by themselves. This is what I believe to be qawlun wasat, a fair and a balanced opinion on the issue. I've heard some of the Imams get hold of the microphone and he will say whoever brings a child less than seven years old, there is no delay for this. The Prophet ﷺ used to allow the small children no problem and we say the same. We don't want to get to the stage where we say don't bring your children, adults only and so on and so forth. It's not nice and it's not the Sunnah. But at the same time we can't tell people to disregard what their children are doing. You have to be in the middle, you have to keep an eye on whether your children are harming other people whether they're being disruptive towards other people and if that's the case and you can take them outside that's what you should do if it is the Jumu'ah khutbah then we have to be a little bit more careful because disrupting the Jumu'ah for others leads to you getting no reward for your Jumu'ah 
khutbah. So it's quite, it's quite a serious issue that you make sure that the children generally, as much as possible, aren't disrupted. And kids are kids. You know, nobody is going to get upset if once or twice, you know, one of the kids starts crying or something like that. This is, kids are kids, children are children. They will have their odd times. But just keep an eye on them and just be sensible and use a little bit of wisdom so that we don't disrupt the classes and the Jum'ah khutbah for other people, inshallah. Jazakumullahu khayran wa barakallahu feekum. Okay, we continue with Kitab al-Tahara, the chapter of purification. And we continue with Bab al-Miyah, the, the chapter dealing with the different types of water. What we have today are four ahadith. Actually, we have a little more than four ahadith, but in terms of the numbering, we have four ahadith. Four. And we're going to cover them all in one block before we talk about the fiqh from them, because the fiqh from them is pretty much related. And if we cover the fiqh after one, then we're going to get confused. Now, this is going to require a little bit of concentration. These next four ahadith are not easy. And there are some areas of ikhtilaf in them and some areas of uh, differences of opinion in wording also. So you, I would request everyone just to, to try to, to stay with me and pay as much attention to it as possible. So our first hadith, وَأَنْ عَبِي سَعِيدٍ الْخُدْرِي رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُ أَنَّهُ قَالْ قَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم إِنَّ الْمَاءَ طَهُورٌ لَا يُنَجِّسُهُ شَيْءٌ أخرجه الثلاثة وصححه أحمد حديث نمبر 2 from Abu Sa'id al-Khudri رضي الله تعالى عنه that he said that the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم said water is purifying remember we said that the word tahur means that it purifies you because in general you have three types of substances in Islam you have a substance which is or if we want to if we want to have a better classification let's start by breaking it into two you have tahir and you have najis you have something which is pure and something which is impure okay some people call this pak na pak you have something that is pure something that is impure in arabic we say tahirun wa najis you have something that is pure and something that is impure out of those things that are tahir, that are pure, you have two types of things. Something which is tahur or mutahir. It purifies other things and something which is simply pure in of itself. And I'll give you a simple example of that. Let's take the example of a glass of milk. Have any of you ever made wudu with a glass of milk? I hope not. Okay, because milk is pure in itself. You can drink it, it's not impure, it's completely pure in itself, but it doesn't purify other things. So you can't make wudu with milk. You can only make wudu with, with water. So if we look at those three things again, we have something which is tahur, or we sometimes say mutahir, it purifies other things. And this is what we're talking about here with water. Inna al ma'a tahur. Water is purifying. It purifies other things. It's pure in itself and it purifies other things. Tahirun fi nafsihi mutahirun li ghayrihi. It's pure in itself and it purifies other things. And if you look at, for example, milk, then milk is pure in itself, but it doesn't purify anything else. You can't wash your clothes with milk. You can't make wudu with milk. You can't make ghusl with milk, even though milk is pure. And then you have something that is najis, that is impure that is impure, something which is not pure. And in this case, we can't drink it or eat it or use it or put it on our clothes and we can't use it to purify anything anything else. So it is غَيْرُ طَاهِرٍ فِي نَفْسِهِ وَغَيْرُ مُطَاهِرٍ لِغَيْرِهِ It's not purifying in itself and it doesn't purify anything else. The shahid or the point here is the Prophet Sallallahu said إِنَّ الْمَاءَ طَهُورٌ لَا يُنَجِّسُهُ شَيْءٍ Water is purifying, nothing makes it impure. Okay? Nothing makes it impure. Nothing makes it impure. Akhrajahu thalatha. Akhrajahu thalatha. The three recorded it. Which three recorded it? Well, we know what the four are. Who remembers what the four are? 
Al Arba'ah from the previous hadith. Who remembers who are the four? Bismillah. It's not an exam. Okay, Ikhtalaf al Ulama. Sunan Abi Dawud. Jami' al Tirmidhi. Ibn Majah. An Nasai. Abu Dawud, An Nasai, Al Tirmidhi, Ibn Majah. I prefer this order. This order is a nice order. Abu Dawud, Al Tirmidhi, An Nasai, Ibn Majah. Type, those are four. Okay? Out of those four, there are three. Which three? Let me, let me see which. Come on, guys. It's not that late. Bismillah. Which three? Okay, let's, let's ask you a more, an easier question. Which one is missing? Raise your hand if you think the missing one is Abu Dawud. Okay, if you think the missing one is An Nasai. I would suggest that the missing one has to be one of the last two, and I'll tell you why. The last two have a reason to miss them out. You could miss out Jami' Tirmidhi because it's not from the Sunan. Right? Jami' Tirmidhi is not from the Sunan. What did we say the Sunan deal with? The Sunan deal with? The Sunan deal with? Ahkam, rulings, halal and haram. And the Jami' deals with everything. So a Tirmidhi is different from the others. So you could miss out a Tirmidhi. Why might you miss out Ibn Majah? Sunan Ibn Majah. Why might you miss out Ibn Majah? Good, it is less authentic than the others, but that's not why you might miss it out, but it is less authentic than the others for certain. Traditionally, Ibn Majah was not one of the Qutb al-Sitta, the six books of Hadith. Okay, I'll ask you a different question. What was the sixth book? when Ibn Majah wasn't the sixth book? No. Good guess though. Muatta al-Imam Malik. Excellent. Muatta al-Imam Malik. Muatta al-Imam Malik was the sixth book of the six books. But then the scholars of Hadith, when they studied this, they realized that Muatta al-Imam Malik is almost universally contained within al-Bukhari and Muslim and the other three. And Ibn Majah has many ahadith in it which are not in any of those and are still authentic. And therefore, from a certain point in time, Ibn Majah was taken as the sixth in the list. So now the question is, does Al-Hafid Ibn Hajar exclude Jami' al-Tirmidhi because it's a Jami' or Ibn Majah because it was not part of the Sunan al-Arba'ah? It's only a yes or no or a black or white question. Which one is excluded? Al-Thalatha. Ibn Majah, sahih. Ibn Majah is excluded. So, Akhrajahu Al-Thalatha, An-Nasai wa Tirmidhi wa Abu Dawud. Abu Dawud, an Tirmidhi, an An-Nasai, without Ibn Majah, wa Sahahahu Ahmad. And Ahmad declared it to be authentic. We'll just read the next hadith and we'll come back to this hadith in a minute. وعن أبي أمامة الباهلي رضي الله تعالى عنه أنه قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم إن الماء لا ينجسه شيء إلا ما غلب على ريحه وطعمه ولونه أخرجه ابن ماجه وضعفه أبو حاتم وللبيهقي الماء طاهر إلا أن تغير ريحه أو طعمه أو لونه بنجاسة تحتث فيه Abu Umama al-Bahili narrated that the Prophet, the Messenger of Allah وسلم, said, Indeed, water cannot be made impure by anything. So far, we have agreement with the previous hadith. Yep, water cannot be made impure with anything. But there is an addition, there is an extra sentence. Except that which changes its smell or its taste or its color. Okay, so this is in agreement with the previous hadith, but there is a uh, there is a an addition to the wording, an addition to the sentence, except that which changes its smell or its taste or its color. And this was narrated by Ibn Majah, and it was declared to be da'if by Abu Hatim. 
Al Hafidh ibn Hajar is the one who is saying this hadith is da'if. Or he is narrating Abu Hatim saying this hadith is da'if. And he narrates also from Al Bayhaqi that the Prophet وسلم, said, Water is tahir. And he didn't say in this one the difference is he didn't say tahur. Water is tahir. And he didn't say tahur. Al Hafid ibn Hajar in some of the narrations of Balugh al Maram says Tahur. He himself says in some of the script in some of the manuscripts of Balugh al Maram it is written Tahur. But in Al Bayhaqi, in Sunan Al Bayhaqi, it is written Tahir. So Tahir means it is pure in itself, but not necessarily that it purifies anything else. I don't think there's a contradiction there, but there's a different word used. Unless its smell changes or its taste changes or its color changes because of something impure that falls into it so we have another addition here what is our addition what is our difference between this wording and the other wording in the first wording we have the word tahur and now we have the word tahir you shouldn't read too much into that it's not greatly important but it is a different word and here we have an additional sentence because of something impure that falls into it. What do we understand in the reverse of that? If the thing that falls into it is not impure, then the water does not become impure. So for example, if I were to drop a teaspoon of sugar into a cup of water, from this hadith in Sunan al-Bayhaqi, it would indicate that this is still pure. It remains pure. It doesn't indicate that it remains purifying, that I can use it for wudu, but at least it indicates that if I put a spoon of sugar into a glass of water, the water does not become najis. Because here, we have here in the first one, we have the indication that if I were to put a teaspoon of sugar into water, the sugar changes the taste of the water. And therefore, if I were to apply the first hadith of Abu Umama al-Bahiri, that would indicate to me that the water has now become impure. However, this addition in Sunan al-Bayhaqi tells me that the thing that falls into the water must be impure. And this hadith is also daif. We'll come to that in a moment. Hadith number four. So, so far we've had the hadith of Abu Sa'id al-Khudri. Okay. Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, the hadith that water is purifying and nothing makes it impure. We've had the hadith of Abu Umama, nothing makes water impure except that which changes its, its smell or its taste or its color. And in Sunan al-Bayhaqi, as a part of hadith number three, the additional wording by something impure that falls into it. So the thing that changes its color or its taste or its smell must be something impure. Hadith number four. وَعَنْ عَبْدِ اللَّهِ بْنِ عُمَرِ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُمَا أَنَّهُ قَالْ قَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ إِذَا كَانَ الْمَاءُ قُلَّتَيْنْ لَمْ يَحْمِلْ الْخَبَثِ وَفِي لَفْظٍ لَمْ يَنْجُسْ أَخْرَجُهُ الْعَرْبَعَةِ وَصَحَّحُهُ بْنُ خُزَيْمَ وَبْنُ حِبَّانِ وَالْحَاكِمِ from Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhumah that he said that the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said if water reaches qullatayn if water reaches qullatayn okay we need to understand what this word qullatayn means before we go any further qullatayn as you will know dirhamayn, riyalayn, sayyaratayn means two two of them, two qulla so what is two qulla? If water reaches two qulla, if water reaches two qulla, it does not carry any impurity. If water reaches two qulla, it does not carry any impurity. And in another word, it does in another wording, it does not become impure. And this was narrated by the four al arba which are Abu Dawud and Nasai. And, and Abu Dawud al-Tirmidhi and Nasai ibn Majah and it was declared authentic by Ibn Khuzayma and Ibn Hibban and Al-Hakim neither of those three are necessarily 
extremely strong in their declaration of a hadith being authentic, but for what it is, it was declared authentic by those three. So we're left with this word qullatayn. So qullatayn means two qulla. What is a qulla? A qulla is a large amount of water. The scholars disagreed whether the word qulla is the same as the Arabic word qilal. And qilal was a word used by a small village near Medina where people used to carry a certain amount of water in a, a sort of a, a customary vessel that they had that was certain to their vill- particular to their village. They used to carry the water in this vessel. However, wherever this qilal or qulla comes from, what matters is that it is 93 and 3 quarters of a sar. We're getting there now. Okay? It is 93 and 3 quarter sar. Okay? Good. A sar, ikhwani, is for mud. And a mud is what a, a man's hand, would, two hands together, can, can cup up. So a sar is a, is a measure of volume, like a litre or a, uh, you know, or a gallon or something like that. It's a measure of volume. It's not a measure of weight. A sar is a measure of volume. And uh, a sar, we know for certain, is for mud. What we don't know or what we disagree over is what equates to a mud. And the scholars differ, differed over a mud between two opinions, the most common of which are 500 mil and 750 mil for a mud. Thus making a sar either two liters or three liters. Happy with that? So a mud, the scholars differed over it with the two main opinions being 500 milliliters and 750 milliliters thus making asar either two liters or three liters from what i've seen i personally prefer the opinion of it being 750 mil and the sar being three liters However, the most common opinion and the opinion that I believe is the standard here in the Emirates is that it is 500 mil and that the sa is 2 liters. But all of the opinions range between those two measures and I don't really want to, to, to worry ourselves too much at the moment. But let's work this out. 93 and 3 quarters of a sa. Now I've got the number in liters written here but I'm just going to work out this according to the two opinions. I'm not that good at maths, so if we'll do it on a calculator. So 93.75, okay, times by 3 litres gives us 281 and a quarter litres. And this is what I believe to be the reliable, the most reliable narration regarding the SAR, is that the SAR is 3 litres. Making this kulla 281.25 litres. However, the opinion that is the norm here in the Emirates and that I believe is the opinion of the majority is 93.75 times by 2, which gives us 187.5. In any case, we said that in my opinion that it's 281 and a quarter, so two of them would be 562 and a half. 562 and a half liters. This is two qulla, 562 and a half liters. So this hadith indicates to us that when water reaches 562 and a half liters, it no longer carries impurity. Meaning whatever you put into it, it will not become impure. As for the water that is less than that, then we get the idea that this hadith is telling us that this water is different in some way again i'm not going to go too much into it until we just cover our last hadith and then we'll talk a little bit we'll go back and we'll talk about them in more detail so our last hadith uh, for today and abi huraira radiallahu anhu 
عن أنه قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم لا يغتسل أحدكم في الماء الدائم وهو جنوب أخرجه مسلم وللبخاري لا يبولن أحدكم في الماء الدائم الذي لا يجري ثم يغتسل فيه ولمسلم ثم يغتسل منه ولأبي داود ولا يغتسل فيه من الجنابة From the hadith of Abu Hurairah that he said that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, let none of you bathe, i.e. make a ghusl, in still water while he is in a state of janaba. Let none of you bathe in still water while he is in a state of janaba. And this hadith is in, is in Sahih Muslim. First of all, let's just deal with a couple of words here. Still water, what does still water mean? Still water is water that doesn't run. Still water is water that doesn't run. I.e., if you go to a stream, a stream is running water. If you go to a river, a river is running water. If you switch on the tap, the tap is running water. Okay? We're talking about a pond or a... Uh, uh, or a, a, a sort of a, a puddle of water or a, an area where the water has collected or a, a bath for example uh, or a, something like this where the water is no longer running it's, it's still water and someone is going to come after you and use that water so it doesn't apply necessarily to the bath that you're just going to unplug the plug and just let the water go down because this is running water you are using it and then getting rid of it but the water that is still that you expect someone may come after you and use. Let not one of you bathe, i.e. make ghusl. Ghusl, as we know, and we're going to come to in detail, is the ritual washing of the body to remove the state of janaba or uh, after menses and childbirth. And specifically this mentions wahua junub, he is in a state of janaba. So what is Janaba? Janaba is a state that a man or a woman uh, falls into after certain things occur. One of those is uh, marital intercourse and one of those is ejaculation whether it takes place as part of intercourse or outside of intercourse. This is called Janaba. This state of Janaba the Prophet ﷺ is telling you, do not bathe in still water while you are in a state of janabah. And this hadith is in Sahih Muslim. And Al-Bukhari has another wording of the hadith. Let not one of you urinate in still water that does not run. That does not run, this is an explanation of the meaning of still water. The still water that does not run. Then wash in it. And in Sahih Muslim, then wash from it. What is the difference between wash in it versus wash from it? Let not one of you urinate in still water that does not move, then wash in it, that's in Bukhari, and in Muslim, and then wash from it. What's the difference between the two? Very good. Which is more general? From it. Very good. So wash from it is more general than wash in it. Wash from it, wash in it would allow you to take the water from the pool and bathe using it, but not for you to get inside the pool itself. However, wash uh, from it would indicate you're not allowed to take the water from it at all. And Abu Dawood has a different wording which says, and do not make ghusl in it from Janaba. Do not make ghusl in it from Janaba. And this is in accordance or similar to the hadith in Sahih Muslim. Let not one of you make ghusl in still water while he is junub in a state of Janaba. So these are all very similar. Again, we have to be really focused on what the differences are here. The first difference is the issue of janaba versus the issue of urinating in the water. The issue of janaba versus the issue of urinating in the water. Urinating in the water is clear. Why it is, uh, you, are, you are putting something which is najis, which is impure, into the water by urinating in the water. 
And when you urinate in still water, the danger is that someone else might come along and decide to use that still water to bathe with or to make wudu from. So that's fairly clear. Don't urinate in still water. Don't bathe in it or from it. And the narration of Sahih Muslim is more general. And generally, that is the narration that is uh, preferred in this regard, that you are not allowed, if you have urinated into still water, into a pot, a pond of still water, you're not allowed to use the water in that pond to uh, bathe with or to make wudu from at all. The next issue here is why mention the junub? And this is something that uh, I wanted to read to you uh, what, and I just came across this while I was sitting in the masjid, because this was, this was troubling me. Why mention the junub? Because there's no doubt this hadith mentioning Janaba is authentic. It's in Bukhari and it's in Muslim. So, or it's in, it's, in, uh, it's in Muslim and it's in Abu Dawud. So here, why mention Janab? I read to you what a Sheikh bin Baz rahimahullah ta'ala said, so that you can have uh, uh, an idea. Sheikh bin Baz, he said, because this person may well be covered in some impure things that come from Janab. So far, so good. Except this is problematic. This statement in itself is also problematic because according to the stronger opinion, which we're going to come to later, that uh, semen is pure and not impure. So therefore, what is the impure substance that may well be on the body from the Janaba? One point is to say that he may well have some impure substances. At the end of the day, when someone ha is in a state of Janaba, they may have some things on their body which are impure substances, that's clear. But just let's argue the point that semen is pure. In that case, how can we say that the person who is in a state of Janaba shouldn't bathe in the water? This is why. Sheikh Mubazi said, and this is a very, very, very clever statement. He said, even if semen is pure, it is still something which is unpleasant. Sahih or not? You clean it, you don't leave it all over the place. And it is something that is unpleasant. And it would be harmful to people or unpleasant for people to make wudu from that water afterwards. Even if it is pure, but people would not make wudu from the water after that. It is something unpleasant. And it may well lead to najasa. Why might it lead to najasa? Because there are other substances during marital relations that are impure by consensus. Such as the pre-ejaculate that comes out and other substances that come out uh, at the time, which are impure by consensus. So it may well be the person has some impurity. Even if they don't have impurity, there's no doubt that they are causing that water to be disliked and, and unusable by someone else. And this brings us an interesting benefit that water, just for it to be unusable, doesn't mean that it is necessarily najis. But it's unusable. And so the same principle applies. And he said, and this is why the junub is specifically mentioned here. Because everyone else, once you mention the junub, minbabi awla, is more deserving. For example, once you have mentioned the junub, does anyone doubt about the lady on her menses? If the junub is not allowed to bathe in the water, is the lady who has finished her menses allowed to bathe? No, because menstrual blood by consensus is najas. Najasa. By consensus. There is no ihtilaf on this issue whatsoever. In fact, it is from the worst of the najasat. From the most, the strongest of the, of the impure substances. Therefore, if the junub bearing in mind that he may well not have any najasa on him at all, is forbidden from using this water, then there's no doubt that the ha'id and the woman on, uh, who has finished childbirth and the man who has some stool or some urine on him, min babi awla, is more deserving of being prohibited from using this water. So we see here the reason why the junub is mentioned, and this uh, really, I was very impressed by the statement of Shaykh bin Baz, rahimahullah ta'ala, 
uh, I thought it was very, very clever, met the way it was mentioned as the reason why. Because as soon as I read the word junub, I start thinking, well, on a technical sense, the junub is not najis in the first place. So why is he prohibited? Because even if it is not najasa, it's still qadirun, it's unclean and it's, it's not nice. It's something which is unpleasant and disliked. And therefore, if that were to go into the water, the water would become unusable even though the water is not najis. As for the issue of the urination, then this is, there is no issue with this. There's no issue with the issue of uh, urinating in the water. That is even clearer. That if you urinate in still water, someone else may come along after you, half an hour after you, an hour after you, two hours after you, and say, let me make wudu from this water. Bear in mind, Ya Ikhwan, we are talking about people living in the desert. Water is not easy to come by. If you see a bowl of still, uh, an area of still water, maybe you will have 10 people come and make wudu from that. You know, there is not a lot of water available. So this is an important hadith with regard to preserving the maslaha am, as they say, the general benefit of the people. Preserving the general benefit, you know, looking for the general benefit of the people. You know, you don't want to be ruining some water that maybe other people are going to come and use after you. We'll come into the we'll come into the questions inshallah towards the end because we still have a lot to cover be in the Again, saliva you can see is a similar thing. Uh, saliva is not impure. There is no difference of opinion on this that I'm aware of. Saliva is not impure. But still saliva is something which is like they say it, they say mustaqbah. It's something which is, you know, it's it's icky. You know, you don't like you don't like to make wudu from something somebody spat in. So again, the same ruling applies that you don't ruin the water for other people. But you know, you spit out to the side, you don't ruin the water for the other people who are going to make wudu from that water. But we'll come to that in the issue of uh, fadl al-wudu, the leftover water of wudu. So now we have to go all the way back to the beginning. And the reason I mention all of these hadith at once, and I'm aware that we probably won't cover all of the fiqh from all of them uh, in one go, but the reason I mentioned all of these ahadith together is that the basic ruling, the basic fiqh of these four ahadith is all the same. It can't, they all revolve around the same issue, which is the issue of when does water become impure. That is the relation of the ahadith to the chapter. If we were to ask why did the author include these ahadith in the chapter, then we would say that the author included these ahadith in the chapter in order to explain the rulings of different types of water, whether large or small, if something impure falls into them, or someone in a state of janaba bathes in them, can they be used for purification or not, since a person may doubt whether or not they can use them for purification. So this is the reason why the author has mentioned these ahadith, all of them together for the same reason. But now we have to go back to hadith number two. Let's just remind ourselves of hadith number two. Inna al-ma'a tahurun la yunajisuhu shay. Water is pure. Nothing makes this water impure. This hadith has a story. And once again, al-Hafid ibn Hajar rahimahullah ta'ala did not mention the story along with the hadith. And there are two reasons why I can think that Al-Hafid ibn Hajar didn't mention the story. The first is Al-Ikhtisar. He doesn't want you to uh, have to memorize a long paragraph. He just wants you to memorize the hadith. And this is his manhaj in Bulugh al-Maran. As opposed to the methodology of Ibn Abdul Hadi. Ibn Abdul Hadi in Al-Muharrar, which is a very similar, almost identical book to Bulugh al-Maran. Ibn Abdul Hadi in Al-Muharrar, he goes to great detail to mention all of the wordings and the stories and the reasons and the ikhtilaf and the narrators and why and where and when and how. He goes to a great detail. Al-Hafid ibn Hajar wants a book you can memorize. So he wants to shorten it down for you. The other reason is that this hadith is a hadith which the scholars differed over its authenticity. And Al-Hafid ibn Hajar is one of those who criticized one of the narrators in the chain. Someone might say, but if he criticized one of the narrators in the chain, why did he bring this hadith and mention that Imam Ahmad declared it to be Sahih? 
The reason for this may be, and I'm only suggesting this, it may be that this hadith in this wording without the story is mentioned from the hadith of Aisha. And it's also mentioned from the hadith of Abu Umama and the hadith of Ibn Abbas. All of them mention this statement, water is purifying, nothing makes it impure. So it may be that a Hafid ibn Hajar is saying, I consider this hadith with the story to be da'if, but without the story to be sahih. However, the correct opinion is, and I'm, I don't want to accuse al Hafid ibn Hajar of saying that since he didn't say it, but just I'm, I'm suggesting a reason why perhaps al Hafid ibn Hajar didn't mention the story, is al Hafid ibn Hajar is one of the people who accused the narrator, and the narrator in this case uh, is... Where is it gone? Hmm. The narrator here is Ubaidullah ibn Abdullah ibn Rafi. Ubaidullah ibn Abdullah ibn Rafi. So this narrator here, Al Hafid ibn Hajar, said about him, Majhul al Hajj. He said that he is unknown in terms of whether he is reliable or not. And that's not true. The correct opinion is that Al Hafid ibn Hajar made a mistake in this. And that uh, he is a reliable narrator. Ubaidullah ibn Abdullah ibn Rafi is a, is a reliable narrator. But in any case, the fact that Al Hafid ibn Hajar said that he is unknown may be a reason why Al Hafid ibn Hajar wouldn't mention the story. Because the wording aside from the story is mentioned in the hadith of Abu Umama, and it's mentioned in the hadith of Aisha, and it's mentioned in the hadith of Ibn Abbas. So that might be a reason why Al Hafid ibn Hajar decided not to mention the story. But in any case, his methodology in Bulugh al Maram is not to mention the stories and the reasons behind it. So, what is the story? The hadith is from Abu Sa'id al Khudri an, that it was said, O Messenger of Allah, should we make wudu from the buda'a well? Should we make wudu from the buda'a well? And it was a well in which were thrown materials used by women in menstruation, foul-smelling things and the flesh of dogs. The Prophet ﷺ replied, water is purifying, it cannot be made impure by anything. And it was narrated by Ahmad and Abu Dawud and Nasai in a Tirmidhi, and he declared it to be fair. And in a wording from Ahmad and Abu Dawud and Adara Qutani, in it would be thrown the things used by women in menstruation, the flesh of dogs and people's excrement. So this story is that there is a well. This well is called the well of al Budar, And it is a well that has a huge volume of water in it. And in this well, there would be thrown al hayat which are the equivalent of sanitary towels used by women in the state of menses. In other words, they didn't have sanitary towels in those times, but they had pieces of cloth. And when they finished with the piece of cloth, they would throw it into this well. The second thing that they would find in it is they would find in it foul smelling things and netnu or a netinu. And these are foul smelling things like, like uh, dead animal corpses and these kind of things. And in one narration, the flesh of dogs, i.e. when the, they would find a dead dog, instead of letting the dog, uh, you know, uh, the smell come out to the people, they would throw it also into the well. And in one narration, Adirun uh, nas, i.e., that the people's excrement, or sort of like uh, foul-smelling things, uh, people's excrement and so on, would be thrown into this well. They found the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam making wudu from this well, and in one of the narrations it was said, "O Messenger of Allah, we see you making wudu from the well of Al Buda'ah. We see you making wudu from the well of Al Buda'ah." And in one narration, should we make wudu from the well of Al Buda'a? The Prophet said, Inna al -ma -a la Water is pure and nothing makes it impure. I'm just going to tie a little link to the hadith of the Qullatain. The two Qulla, which we said is 500 and uh, whatever we came to, 562 and a half. 
liters. This well was undoubtedly more than that in volume. And if you want an example, because people might, uh, people might be thinking about this and thinking, really, you make wudu from a well that has all these things thrown into them. But you imagine if you throw an animal carcass into the sea, does the sea become impure? No. If you throw, you know, akramakumullah, people's excrement or sanitary towels into the sea, does the sea become impure? No. We know that if water reaches a certain amount, that impurity doesn't spread into the water itself. So you don't pick the water up and you don't have any impurity in it. Hold that thought because we haven't got there yet. We haven't got to the fiqh of the hadith. We haven't started talking about when you can and when you can't and what the conditions for that are. We just want to understand each hadith. So in this hadith, there is a well called the well of al buda And this well is well known that people throw filthy najasat into this well. Things that there is no doubt whatsoever are najis. Sanitary towels, the flesh of dogs, carcasses, and uh, people's excrement. There's no doubt that these things are all of them najasat. There's no doubt the Prophet ﷺ made wudu from the well. And that he said, Water is purifying, nothing makes it impure. Nothing makes it impure. We've understood hadith number two, I think, uh, more or less. Now we come to hadith number three. Hadith number three is the same as hadith number two, but it gives us a condition or a set of conditions. And that is that for the water to be considered pure, it must not have changed in color or taste or smell. So far so good. It must not have changed in color or taste or smell. This hadith is a hadith which is da'if. And there is no doubt the hadith is da'if. It is declared da'if by Abu Hatim and likewise by al hafiz Ibn Hajar, Abu Hatim in Al-Ilal. Uh, wa Abu Hatim, he said, this hadith is valid as a statement of the tabi'i from the Prophet i.e. one of the tabi'i from the Prophet So it's not a valid hadith in any case. Uh, however, Al-Bayhaqi also mentioned water is pure unless it is changed or its smell, taste and color is changed by something impure which falls into it. Al-Bayhaqi, at the end of this hadith, I will read you what Al-Bayhaqi said. Al-Bayhaqi said, وَالْحَدِيثُ غَيْرُ قَوِي إِلَّا أَنَّا لَا نَعْلَمُ فِي نَجَاسَةِ الْمَاءِ إِذَا تَغَيَّرَ بِالنَّجَاسَةِ خِلَافًا ثُمَّ حَكَى عَنِ الشَّافِعِي أَنَّهُ قَالْ مَا قُلْتُ مِنْ أَنَّهُ إِذَا تَغَيَّرَ طَعْمُ الْمَاءِ وَلَوْنُهُ وَرِيحُهُ كَانَ نَجِسًا يروى عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم من وجه لا يثبت أو لا يثبت أهل الحديث مثله أو مثله وهو قول العامة لا أعلم بينهم فيه خلافا. This statement of al-Bayhaqi and the statement of the Shafi'i with it is very important. Al-Bayhaqi said this hadith is غير قوي. It is not a strong hadith. So this hadith is not strong. Except that we do not know with regard to this principle of najasa in water any disagreement among the scholars. So what is Al-Bayhaqi using for evidence here? Ijma. Al-Bayhaqi is not using this hadith as evidence. Al-Bayhaqi is saying there is ijma that the words found in this hadith are true but they are not authentic from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi the first one Abu Hatim said is authentic as a statement of one of the tabi'een not as a statement of the Prophet and the second wording regarding the change of the color with something najis and the, the smell and the taste Al-Bayhaqi said this hadith is not strong except that we do not know with regard to the impurity of water if it changes by something impure any disagreement and as Shafi'i said that which I have said that which I have said, i.e. my madhab, with regard to the fact that if the taste of water and its color and its smell change, it is najis, 
is narrated from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. A shafi is going to give you a faida. It's narrated from the Prophet sallallahu from a chain that the people of Hadith do not declare the likes of it to be authentic. This is the benefit of an Imam Shafi. An Imam Shafi is a muhaddith. He's giving you a benefit. He's saying, what I have told you in my madhab is that if water changes color or smell or taste with something which is najis, then we consider the water to be najis. An Imam Shafi said, this statement has been reported from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. مِنْ وَجْهٍ لَا يُثْبِتُ أَهْلُ الْحَدِيثِ مِثْلَهُ From an angle or a chain that the people of hadith do not consider to be authentic. So it is though a shafi'i is warning you, he's saying in the books of fiqh, you will find this hadith. But I am telling you as a muhaddith, this hadith is not authentic. However, a shafi'i said, مَا قُلْتُ أَنَا What I said. So therefore, a shafi'i, why does he get this opinion from? Where does a Shafi'i have a delil for this opinion from? A Shafi'i said, It is the statement of the majority. It is the opinion of the majority. I do not know any disagreement among any of the scholars on this issue. So yet again, a Shafi'i, before al Bayhaqi, because al Bayhaqi came out after, a Shafi'i and al Bayhaqi after him, are saying that this hadith, the principle found within it, is thabitun bil ijma. It is a matter of consensus, even though the hadith itself is weak. Okay, so far, so good. We're only just going to cover a couple more points, then we have to stop. We'll cover the fiqh next lesson, but we just want to understand the ahadith properly. From Abdullah ibn Umar, that he said to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said, if water reaches two qulla, it does not hold any impurity and in a narration it is not made impure this is a hadith that the scholars differed over its authenticity ibn abdul bar and others spoke negatively about it and declared it to be weak however this hadith is authentic and from those who declared it authentic was al-imam ahmad and ishaq ibn rahway and Ibn al-Jarud, Ibn Hibban, Ibn Hazm, al Nawawi, Ibn al-Mulaqin, al Dahabi, Ibn Hajar, al Zaylai, al Albani. All of them declared this hadith to be authentic. From those who declared the hadith to be weak, Abdullah ibn Mubarak and Ibn Abdul Bar and Ibn al Arabi, al Maliki. And from those who declared it to be from the statement of Ibn Umar, al Bayhaqi, and al Mizzi, and Shaykh al Islam, Ibn Taymiyyah, Rahimullah, al Jamia. However, we say that the answer is that this hadith is insha'Allah authentic regarding the Qullatayn. But you will need to remember that this is a hadith that has disagreement over its authenticity for the fiqh principle because otherwise this hadith will get us into some problem with regard to the issue of fiqh. So, the scholars with regard to the authenticity in this hadith divided into three groups. One said it is authentic one said it is not authentic and one said it is authentic as the statement of Ibn Umar not as the statement of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the stronger opinion is that it is authentic as the statement of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam In the last hadith which is the hadith regarding the still water the only extra point that I want to mention is an addition from, if I'm not mistaken, Abu Hurairah radiallahu ta'ala an, that they said to Abu Hurairah, Abu Sa'ib, he said to Abu Hurairah, how should we then do it? So he said to Abu Hurairah, if we're not allowed in a state of Janaba to go into the water, how should we then do it? Abu Hurairah replied, yatanawaluhu tanawulan, he should take out handfuls so Abu Hurairah gave and this is not part of the hadith but it's narrated in some of the wordings of the hadith that they asked Abu Hurairah how should we deal with this water and Abu Hurairah said take it out in handfuls i.e. the water that is clean but is in a small amount don't dive into it if you're in a state of Janaba but put your hand in and take out handfuls of the water to make ghusl with 
what I'm going to do is stop there because I'm, I'm aware that I, uh, I keep, I'm keeping you longer than I promised. And the fiqh of these ahadith is going to be a little bit detailed.